Anton Weber. Was he a Nazi or was he not a Nazi? Hi all, today we're going to talk about Anton Webern and no, you shouldn't just skip this video because it's about an atonal composer because at the very least we can all learn a little bit more about history, about music, and about who Webern was and why you should care. But before we dive in, I just wanted to mention that our newest album, Movements, came out about a month ago. So if you haven't yet, go check it out on Apple Music, Spotify, or what have you. It's all Ilya's music. It's pretty great and it's worth taking time to listen. Webern lived from 1883 to 1945 and was born Anton Friedrich Wilhelm von Webern, though he never used any of his middle names. And the von in von Webern was also dropped in 1919 in accordance with the Habsburg Law, which was basically a law that abolished nobility in German Austria. The Habsburg Law, incidentally, was more targeted towards the Habsburgs, the traditional Austro-Hungarian ruling family. It stripped them of all lands and titles, but it also applied to any other family with noble blood. And this was usually indicated by the Vaughn in the name, not to be confused with Van, which is more Belgian, like in Beethoven's case, and there's a big difference, but that's another story. So luckily for the Weberns, they didn't have too much in the way of ancestral wealth anymore, so it wasn't much of a difference other than just dropping the Vaughn from their name. He began attending classes in Vienna University in 1902, studying musicology, not composition, interesting enough. Actually, he had a deep interest in Renaissance and early music, and his thesis was on Renaissance composer Heinrich Isaac. So maybe something can be said of this music influencing his writing style. Not necessarily grand and florid, but direct and concise. Thesis. 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 Okay. His thesis. Thesis. His thesis. <laughs> You're not gonna kill somebody with that word. Thesis. If early music wasn't enough, Webern was also fascinated with art, particularly the works of Albrecht Dürer and Giovanni Sagantini. Now, if you don't know these artists, it's definitely worth checking them out. There is something really deeply wonderful about their works. The fantastical quality of Dürer's prints and the directness in which Segantini approaches the idea of loneliness as a positive quality in nature found their way into Webern's earliest works, such as the 1905 Single Movement Quartet. After graduating, he took lessons directly from Schomburg, understanding that composition was the course his life was now taking. And from this instruction, not only he gained an instructor, but also two of the most important relationships in shaping his musical direction, Schomburg and Berg. Webern was actually very nationalistic, and I mean, he really loved German music, even going so far as to refer to it in its utter supremacy, quote, of all other Western music. And actually the supremacy of just music as a whole, because anything other than Western music wasn't even a topic of conversation at that time. He helped organize and operate the Society for Private Musical Performances from 1918 to 1921 which were concerts of recent and new music. Bartok, Berg, Buzzoni, DBC, Korngold, Mahler, Ravel, Reger, Satie, Strauss, Stravinsky. And himself. And himself. And by 1921, the hyperinflation in the currency forced the society to fall apart. He 
He was also taking work conducting the Vienna Workers Symphony Chorus and Orchestra, and he was also the chorus master of Mödling Men's Choral Society. And here's where we really start to get into the meat of during the war years. He voluntarily resigned from this last post over a controversy that was started when he hired a Jewish singer to replace a sick singer. Webern had the misfortune to have lived through both World War I and World War II. He also was an Austrian, and the implications of that stand out immediately. Was he a Nazi or was not he? Was he a Nazi or was not he a Nazi? Was he a Nazi or was he not a Nazi? The times will tell. The answer is it's really not that simple. Was he a Nazi or was he not a Nazi? Webern was not a member of the Nazi party. Neither was he Jewish. Ironically, however, both he and Berg, who also wasn't Jewish, were both characterized as Jewish degenerate composers by the Nazi party. And both of them found it very difficult to make a living as a result of that. On the other hand, Webern was surrounded by people from all political standpoints. Schoenberg was a fervent Zionist, but his own son Peter was a Nazi. He himself was ambivalent, leaning first this way, then the other. You have to imagine that time in Austria. It was an incredibly turbulent period, in 20s and 30s. And it was easier to be swayed one way or another. People were starving, the economy was a mess, and there was no clear understanding of what exactly the outcome of the Nazi party would be. Webern was himself a Roman Catholic. He wasn't especially devout, but religion as a whole, since it did not spring immediately from Nazi ideology, was generally regarded with suspicion. So the idea with the Nazi party, and actually a lot of the ideologies during that time, was that the state came for the church. Your loyalty was first and foremost to your nation, and only after that could religion begin to play a part. So Webern was actually deeply nationalist and was convinced that, quote, only the superior old German culture can save this world from the demoralized condition into which it has been thrown. So what did he mean by this? We can take it at face value. Germans are better, German culture is better than everyone else's, which he did clearly think. However, what was going on around him during that time? This statement refers not so much to any religion or race, but to a true abhorrence of the jaded, cynical behavior of young people who felt in their gut that something was really wrong in society. Young people turned to violence quickly, and there was no reliable government that could in any way curtail this growing rage. The young people in Webern's eyes were so very Bolshevik, and note his interpretation of the word here, meaning to his generation of Austrian people, without discipline or cultural cultivation. It is difficult to pinpoint Webern's views down exactly, since they were constantly in flux. He had close personal friends who were Jewish and at the same time maintained a mildly anti-Semitic outlook. So there's this one side in this kind of horror at the deeply unsettled time in his country, and then the Nazis came in with no specifically clear agenda in the beginning, other than being a focus for the rage. When Nazism first reared its head right at the beginning, it was not so much a coherent doctrine or even a body of interrelated ideas. It was much, much vaguer. It was more like a worldview just made up of kind of a Frankenstein of different prejudices, whatever would appeal to the audiences and gain them support and inevitably turn them into Nazis. Nazism could hardly even have been dignified with the term ideology at the beginning. It was quite simply just disorganized anger, which they then found a way to harness. So Weber might have been nationalistic at heart and might have been mildly interested in what Hitler and the Nazi party began with, to return to Germanic roots. But his own art form came under fire. And when the culture itself began not to return to Germanic roots, 
and instead to some kind of hysterical warped representation of German culture, fueled by the common sense of outrage, he really started to cool down to the whole party. He was not a Nazi, neither was he not a Nazi, he was just a man trying to live in his art, and having it crushed at every turn, just by the grace of having lived during this time period. And while he's gained more favor in recent years, his music is still regarded with something like suspicion. So how much has really changed? I know this is kind of a sensitive topic, but it's also incredibly relevant. I think maybe today more than ever. It's important for us to understand our history and learn from our multi, multi-faceted mistakes. But there's so much more to talk about with Webern, and we could go on and on. There will be another episode on Webern, so stay tuned. And if you liked this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, leave us a comment, and we'll see you next time. Cheers!